Why do people think if you deprive yourself of sugar that the cancer won't be able to grow or that sugar does make cancer grow? I believe that people have misinterpreted Otto Warburg's findings. He did a phenomenal job in terms of how tumor cells have some reliance on increasing glucose absorption. It's kind of easy from somebody who doesn't study this particular thing right. to say, there must be some sort of reliance on glucose. If I cut out the glucose, cancer is gone. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janasia. I'm a hematologist oncologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And today I'm super excited because I have someone that I'm actually pretty upset I didn't find out about earlier. His name is Dr. Joseph Zundel. And he basically, if I'm geeky and nerdy when it comes to the clinical things, meaning what happens in the, in the, in the patient room, he's geeky and nerdy about all the stuff that allow oncologists to be able to basically, you know, stay on top of therapies and treat cancers. Joseph, we're so excited to have you. I love your videos on Instagram because you really teach us about the sciencey things about escape mechanisms with cancer and also busting a lot of myths. And you and I, I think, share the same, which I'm going to get to in a second. But thank you for being here. And what, what, what got you into that geeky stuff? Why do you, is it so enigmatic, the cancer process and just kind of figuring out, I think, the most dubious challenge of humankind? Uh, so first of all, just let me thank you for, for being here in the first place. It's an absolute honor. Um, and I also found you a little bit too late in the game too. And it's kind of surprising, uh, maybe a little bit too, but the actual, like the, the cancer space on social media is, is very limited. I think there's, there's really only a few of us trying to, uh, tackle this problem, but right. kind of, you know, what got me into, into cancer biology is, um, one, I realized kind of early on that I've always been interested in science, but the, the main reason that I'm in cancer biology and became a cancer biologist researcher is because of personal reasons, because I, uh, I lost my mom to um, oh. esophageal cancer. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's, that's okay. I mean, that's a stubborn one to treat. I mean, recently we've got found some more things, but it's, it's just, it's very difficult. I'm sorry. There's just some cancers that are just more stubborn than others. And I had a pretty good uh, podcast with Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, the Pulitzer Prize winner of Emperor All Maladies. Mm -hmm. And he kind of shed a lot of light on why pancreatic cancer, for example, is, is really quite challenging because it's not just the properties that are inside the cancer itself, mm -hmm. but pancreatic cancer is known to hijack other cells, almost like a, like a hostage or a shield. Uh, and those cells of our own body kind of repel, you know, our own defenses to attack it. So that's one strategy pancreatic cancer uses. Uh, also, Sandeep Patel told us that they're starting to think that there's a bacteria around some pancreatic cells that probably was in you already that somehow metabolizes or eats up the chemotherapy right before you get there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. And do you have, I mean, I guess, you know, an answer that can be captured in an hour on what are some of the kind of key features that make some cancers so stubborn, obviously, if we can target it, target the thing that makes it grow and get bigger, that's always a good thing. Like HER2 positive breast cancer. Right. That was a super aggressive feature that you just prayed you didn't have before, right? And then all of a sudden, now you want HER2 positive rather than being triple negative. Why? Because now we can actually attack the thing that makes it, right. you know, grow. Yeah, and they right? actually, they, they just came out with a new therapy for um, cancers that express high levels of HER2 uh, receptor expression. Right. Low, exactly. low receptors. Yeah. Low receptors. So like, that's what was crazy is that all of a sudden, like everything we consider to be HER2 negative, which was a two plus mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and I keep saying this on social media, please, if you have breast cancer and you're told you're triple negative, or even if you're hormone positive, but HER2 negative, you have to go back to the pathology and see if you were one plus because forever for 25, 30, however many years that was considered negative. And all of a sudden last summer, and that's why it was a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, is it? Is it clinically negative? And then they tested the drug, uh, which is you know called NHER2, and they they were like, oh wait a second, we can target it. And so that's some of the like one of the you know very many humbling things about where we're at. But can't, what are two things if you could if you can about m what makes cancers some just so stubborn or what are the features? Is it that they have escape mechanisms? Is it hijacking the immune system? All of the above? Yeah. So this is going to be a very complex answer and it's something that I actively try and display on my page, um, especially from a layman's terms perspective. Um, and it's the hallmarks of cancers. Have you read those papers? I ha I've read some of them. Yeah. When yeah, you alluded so, to it in the email. Yeah, exactly. And so they, they, we've been adapting those, those biological mechanisms for how cancers uh, utilize a very diverse uh, amount of strategies to to continue to sustain their growth, whether it's, uh, like you said, hijacking immune cells or suppressing immune responses or utilizing microbes to kind of, in their particular environment, continue to uh, combat for resources and, and continue to grow. 
or whether it's not hijacking nearby blood vessels via a process called angiogenesis uh, to grow towards a tumor and continue to supply something like oxygen uh, when a tumor becomes devoid of oxygen, which is a condition known as hypoxia. So there's all of these genetic and environmental contributions, um, whether it's through mutations or environmental stimuli, which can help to drive an environment to sustain tumor growth, cell division, and metabolism. Right. And that's what, you know, is interesting because I used to, you know, inappropriately, and I saw on your post too, sometimes you're like, oh, I've, I've learned something because of social media. I used to say, you know, well, what happens when you have a good response and all of a sudden the, the cancer cell, like, gets smarter? And, and Sid, he was like, well, remember, I mean, you're not saying that they get smarter. Like, he was, you know, kind of speaking to the point that a lot of times the majority of the cancer will melt away. You need about 300 million cells to see it on average CT scan. He's like, right. but if you have a high burden, the chance that you have a, a, a mutation that's already going to be resistant sometimes will show itself when it grows big enough, like in 15 you know, months or so. Or That's why a lot of comments I would get would be like, oh, pharma industry and cancer, they just you know take care of it 15 months and, and coincidentally it starts to reappear. And I was like, there's some merit. I've learned a lot of these comments. I'm like, there's some, I could see how it seems that way. But really it's, again, once you know that it takes 200 million cells, you're like, oh, that, that was already pre-suited to escape the mechanism, but 99.9% .9 of it would. So like they were all her too high, for example, mm -hmm. and they all like started to shrink up. And then you have a little tiny colony that you can't see that like, you know, basically declares itself. But what you're saying is, if I'm not mistaken, they kind of are getting smarter. It's not the fact that they're having a brain and saying, oh, I need to make this target. But what happens is, if, for example, when you were talking about, you know, to block all the blood vessel flow, like say that's the oil and gas for the cancer. Mm -hmm. We use drugs like that, TKIs, Bevacizumab, a lot, those that are like to be juicy cancers, like renal cell carcinoma mm -hmm. and, and, and colon cancers. And, and, and there's certain cancers where it's pretty effective to just cut off that blood supply. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying, and it makes sense, is that environment around the cancer, either before treatment is one thing, but then even after treatment, if you're blocking it, there's obviously signals and stuff being released to where the cancer cell doesn't think necessarily, but all of a sudden has to perform or basically reshape itself or reassemble itself to then accommodate for that you know, situation. And in, so in that sense, kind of, they do get smarter, right? But more so, they just adapt to their environment like our regular cells do. Yeah, so I think a lot of people, when they view cancer, they kind of view it in this lens that it's a homogenous or simple cellular population. Um, but as tumor cells grow, when they, especially in later stages, they develop kind of in different ways. And this is where, uh, when we start our, our education, and I think it's the same in your, your MD track courses, you kind of learn as of, of cancer as a, like an evolutionary disease. And this, this is where we go back to the adaptation. So a single cancer or a single tumor can develop in a bunch of different ways, depending on where the cancer cells are in the tumor. And that will change not only the mutational status of or statuses of, of how those tumor cells have developed in their particular environments, but also the various uh, components that they will metabolize to continue to sustain their growth. Like I said, there are there are hypoxic cores, tumors, uh, various issue, uh, uh, regions of tumors that are very very low in oxygen. That'll be very very different metabolically and genetically uh, compared to cells on the periphery of the tumor. And, and so some. Often, when you guys give a, a chemotherapeutic in the clinic, you'll take care of those cells where the chemotherapeutic is against a specific target on the cancer, but then you're leaving a subset of tumor cells that evolve in a particular way that aren't going to respond to that therapy, and, and they will kind of grow out when you take care of um, you know, the cells that the, the chemotherapy had targeted. So that's often some, some reasons why we see uh, chemo resistance in the clinic. Um, so that's, that's one way... Um, one way we can combat chemo resistance is by combining various therapies to target those multiple mechanisms that might exist in the various types of cells that have evolved very, very differently throughout the whole uh, entirety of the tumor. Yeah, and that's interesting that you say that because that's why I think there's a lot of people looking at, and I myself usually favor this strategy, is you know, somebody may ask, okay, if I have, you know, 20 lesions or 15, like, why don't we just go 
you're telling me, you know, that I can't resect them all or take them all out, which ideally, you know, you would think, why not? If they're in different places, then I had lost all the cancer. Well, one, that's all the cancer you can see, but obviously we know that there's more than that. Right. But two, there's something called stereotactic radiation or SBRT, where you just basically neutralize or nuke that little colony. And this, this conversation is all about oligometastatic disease. And that means you just oligo means in Latin, like a couple, you know, one or two couple places, and you take care of the primary lesion. But the way I like to use it, and again, the data is still like, is, is trying to be formulated to support it is, once you have that initial kill, like you said, if 99.99% of it is, is uh, fallible or basically like melts away, then if I see one lesion being stubborn or start to come up, that's when I'll do what's called SBRT to it because if I have a complete response everywhere else, I'm like, let me just nuke the colony on the current treatment that they're on that it's resistant to without having to table the whole therapy that seems to work on a lot of the disease. And so that's the, what you call the heterogeneity of it. And I think one way somebody can appreciate it is basically the same way that sometimes athletes, you know, they'll go train on purpose, like up really high atmosphere. Why? Because that like makes you bind on the oxygen more and kind of like boost your like blood a little bit because you have, you know, increased oxygen carrying capacity. That's adaptation. A lot of times if they're going to play us, LSU in the South, they're not used to the humidity. So a lot of times they get in trouble in the fourth <laughs> quarter. It's the same way that you're adapting in a macro level on your muscles and your breathing and all that stuff, but all the way down to a cellular level. Something as simple as, I remember I was reading a Sherlock Holmes book and they're like, I can tell he's a truck driver because he had his arm out and it was more weathered. And that skin was actually more coarse and weathered because of the sun like shining on it than obviously the right arm. And, the, and you know, it led to something or another that, that I think is a little bit of a stretch on Sherlock, but it's the same concept. So anyone listening to this, think about those things that our bodies on a macro, you know, large cellular level can do and understand that there is a whole like constellation of tools that inside the one specific cell that is able to adapt to all these things yeah now one thing i'm going to ask you about because you're just you're, you're so like obviously peaceful and poised and this is the thing that's going to ravel you or unravel you i think because it unravels me and i'm glad you said it so bluntly on your platform and that was sugar bro you don't eat sugar and you're not going to get cancer and i i laugh but it does again i i've gotten humbled on social media because i realize people just want like, that that tells me they're desiring to know things mm -hmm. and they're like wanting to take actionable steps and i will take that any day yeah but the two things that really you, you know do i agree hurt me or kind of inflame a little bit are no sugar diets and then also alkaline water but let's start with the sugar diets I'm not going to ask you how sugar, like, obviously the way sometimes I say it is if I give you no calories, like no glucose, your glucose glucometer was zero. Yes, your cancer cell died, but so did you, right? So like, obviously you need some glucose to be able to like have viability of life. But I'm going to ask you instead of saying, why don't, why is that a myth? Why, why did that come about? Why do people think if you uh, deprive yourself of sugar that the cancer won't be able to grow or that sugar does make cancer grow? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this, this actually makes my blood boil too. Uh, I think very similarly to you, but I've actually changed a lot, uh, in terms of my messaging as I've grown my account to be more empathetic, to try and understand where this yeah. argument had originated. Cause initially I was just pissed off. I'm like, how can people think this kind of like crazy that this is that simple? And so going back to the, the meat and bones of it, basically, um, you know, I calmed down my, my mentality about it and I just started asking people, just try and figure out where the root of this was, was coming from. And I actually, I think I figured it out. Uh, I think a lot of this stems from uh, people's misinterpretations of Otto Warburg's findings in like the 1920s, oh. which is kind of interesting to you and I, because uh, we've learned a lot, a lot about how cancer cells utilize a variety of different fuel sources um, to contain uh, or sustain their, their growth demands, um, even outside of just utilizing carbohydrates. Um, so I believe that people have misinterpreted Otto Warburg's findings, who, you know, he received the Nobel Prize and all, did a phenomenal job in terms of uh, kind of establishing this tumor metabolism field um, and how tumor cells have some reliance on uh, increasing glucose absorption. Um, but people have taken this way out of context because of those early findings of seeing how glucose uptake is increased in cells and that this creates... Um, you know, the Warburg effect, uh, oddly, you know, named after him because uh, he, you know, he discovered it. But they've taken this out of effect and extrapolated it in such a way where 
because of his observations now, it, it's kind of easy from somebody who doesn't study this particular thing right. to say, okay, increased glucose absorption uh, witnessed in tumor cells. There must be some sort of reliance on glucose. If I cut out the glucose, uh, cancer is gone. But obviously, right. uh, when we look at the literature, especially from now, between the 1920s and 2023, a lot of time has passed, and we know that glucose is simply, very, very yeah. simply, and I might even be saying this somewhat wrongly, but a means to an end, to sustain tumor, te- uh, tumor cell metabolism. Glucose absorption might be an increase, or might be increased in many tumor types, you know, like pancreatic cancer in, as an example, to increase the the metabolic outputs of the citric acid cycle um, as a means of like stimulating glutamine increase into the citric acid cycle, depending off there's uh, mutations of enzymes in the citric acid cycle or, or glutaminase one highly expressed in, in some cancers, like one of the cancers that I studied. So again, uh, glucose increase in cancers is a means to an end. And I believe that a lot of this stems from uh, misinterpretations of, of Otto Warburg's finding back in the 1920s. People need 100%. to move on. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's what I. That's what I found too. Is is when I try to find back where you know where does that come from? Let me. The simple way to think about it, in my opinion, and I'm oversimplifying it for a PhD, but you have to. There were you know, and you feel too like there's a lot of miss. Uh, there's a lot of abuse with supplements. Not in just not just for like cancer stuff or cancer prevention stuff. Mm-hmm. And even the word prevent, I know, is like is is a difficult word. But um, but. There's a lot of misuse in supplements, but one thing, at least when it comes to exercise, is if you're trying to get bigger and bulk up, like you have to have a certain amount of protein because your requirements to be 300 pounds of muscle are going to be less than 140. And so in the same principle, yes, if this unregulated colony of cells or these like cancer cells that are malignant, I... I think of them as like the venom, like from Spider-Man. I had nightmares of venom, like like back in the day when I was a child. I okay. still don't. I mean, that, not that I still do. Or like the Raphael or, you know, one of these, like, you just think of it like he's the kind of bigger muscular Ninja Turtle. That's what cancer cells are to a degree. They just have more like um, catabolic, you know, like uh, reserve. They need to break, uh, grow. They're, they're unregulated. They're not nice and pretty in order. And therefore... Just like that, what bodybuilder needs more protein, these cancer cells like may have an increased glucose like requirement because they're malignant. Mm-hmm. But your glucose meter can't reach a, like zero. Like if we got labs, like it makes sense in the sense that yeah, sure, if you like didn't have sugars, then it would kill the cancer cell. But again, your body requires cancer cells too, and that's why interestingly, like a PET scan is basically looking at that. The PET scan is showing things that are hot. Yeah. Based on you know the metabolism of glucose, not exactly, but basically, and that's why you have to fast for them, and that's why the brain, which is always hot, right. like a cancer cell, and uses a lot of glucose because we're like every word that I'm saying is being processed, it lights up on a PET scan. Yeah, and so this is actually something that I've tried to explain on my channel too, and and I think people have misinterpretations due to just just what a PET scan is. is you're using a radioactive form of of glucose, uh, which when it's absorbed by cells. Literally all cells in your body utilize glucose to some extent, especially your brain, very metabolic tissues like your heart, your muscle tissue. So technically in a PET scan, everything is literally glowing, but the final image that patients see from a PET scan is something that's processed. So they they actually reduce the background noise from every cell in your body that's glowing to some extent to find the cells that are glowing a little bit more than the other cells in the proximity to find where the tumors are. So those final images that people see of PET scans are processed, but at the core of it, all cells in your body utilize glucose to some extent. We're just utilizing image processing methods to try and find and pinpoint where the tumors are, where the cells that are utilizing glucose more than cells in the, in the neighboring environment. So right, I think and not every awesome. scan, not every like cancer is PET po- avid either. Like you know, some yeah. prostate cancers, a lot of prostates won't be avid even though you have the cancer or bright rather. Um, and same with some renal cell cancers, kidney cancers. So it, 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 it all goes back to the properties, which really overall is how we started this podcast, which is they all have different features and properties. And that's why, you know, the book that I'm writing is called like, it's time to cancel the term, a cure for cancer. And it sounds like, why would you say that? We're oh, I think that's it. great. Right, because it's, it's not, it's not a, it will never be a singular cure, right? It'll be like, it'll be, you know, a constellation of things and it'll yeah, be different. A technical cure. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. A technical cure. So... 
that's you know that's a good I, I think that hopefully anyone listening and again like you I've been so humbled in the last couple of years at first you know you're just like oh no that's you know and then you're like then you empathize you're like people just want to know things and believe it yeah you know that, we're not even going to tackle the alkaline water because it just very simply can be explained in the acidity of your stomach and how that would at all relate to your blood is crazy because our kidneys constantly are like in communication with our lungs and our acid base levels are changed so 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 just like precisely when it comes to even exercise or altitude or anything else that the water we consume in our stomach is not going to like change or thwart that process our kidneys i think are one of the most like like uh uh, unsung organs for how smart they are and what they do for us. Yeah, and I say that a little partially because I'm a hematologist and they also regulate how much blood we need and they kind of. So you're biased. Them. Yeah, that's right. I'm a little biased. That's okay. But um, Can but you- tell me. So yeah. that's the part on like the 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 kind of use and, and energy of cells and how they differ from ours and how they kind of dynamically acclimate and change and have to adapt to their environments. A lot of times, which we're affecting with treatments, right in the in the cancer clinic. Mm-hmm. Immune system stuff. What do you what do you like to kind of talk about that? What are some of the most interesting pearls on on kind of what may enable a cancer cell to either hijack, escape, etc.? So believe it or not, actually, I, I I just recently got a job. I work at a um, at an industry company, um, specifically testing bispecific antibody therapies um, as immunotherapies to target cancers. So. Regarding the immune system, one thing that we commonly see is, is cancer cells will downregulate or reduce the total amount of receptors that the immune cells can recognize on their cell surface to kind of hide uh, from them. And this is actually one of the hallmarks of cancers is immune cell evasion. And so they'll reduce these receptors to hide from the immune system, and that's how they can continue growing. So um, what we do from a clinical perspective and from a technical mechanistic perspective is we'll find specific things on the surface of tumor cells um, to kind of guide the immune cells, um, specifically things like T cells or even innate immune components like dendritic cells or even macrophages to target cancer cells to kind of boost, uh, and I say this somewhat loosely, boost anti-tumor immunity. Um, As you know, in the clinic, you utilize a lot of immunotherapies. Earlier, we were discussing you use a Keytruda, which is uh, anti-PD-01, to target this receptor that actually suppresses T cell responses, a very important adaptive immune cell component uh, within our body to target these cancer cells. So by utilizing uh, an antibody therapy or an immunotherapy like Keytruda, you can block this receptor uh, called PDL1 on cancer cells. Actually, I might even be flipping the two. I don't, is it cancer cells that have PDL1? And it's like, yeah, the PD1, PDL1 interface, right? Yeah, anyways, and they block that interaction, interaction, and you yeah, can, you're blocking you can, that stop sign, exactly. Right, so that. But what you're talking about before that that part of it with the bispecific, you're saying you're recognizing, like, whereas PD1, PDL1, that process is a stop sign to evade. Mm-hmm. You're saying some cells actually like take away receptors that are kind of a, a green light or or something shady, like a red flag, and they're actually you know keeping that red flag to themselves. So when you're talking about by specifics, you're saying that you're looking for a receptor that's unique to the cancer cell, presumably to some degree, or at a high expression, and then it's carrying with it chemotherapy, correct? Exactly. Yeah, it can either be unique, like a tumor specific antigen. So oftentimes because of um, specific metabolic changes that kind of get messed up in cancer cells, uh, the proteins that make it to the surface of the, of the cancer cells will be different enough that we can design antibody-based therapies to target that specific thing. That's why it's called a tumor antigen. Or like you mentioned, and I guess like I just previously mentioned, they'll reduce the total level of expression of a particular receptor. We have to find different ways to, uh, to target those cancer cells. Yeah, or for sure. Stop, uh, the suppression signals. Right. And I think, you know, you are one of the best people to be able to tell us about how when we look at things, this is a big one for me, Mm -hmm. that when you test it in mice, and even when you test it in mice, there is a difference on how you test it, right? Like what's happening. And one really good example I had with a previous guest, I can't remember who it was, and I feel bad, Ian Walters, I think. When you take a cancer cell that's like either produced in a dish or basically, you know, out of somebody's body, and you just put it into a mouse, you could sprinkle like fairy dust or the drug that you're studying. And then when you look at it in six to eight, eight weeks, it's like, oh my gosh, the cancer's all gone. The fairy dust worked or the therapy that we had worked. But what's happening is you now 
basically are taking the cancer that wasn't exposed to the innate, which means like just inherent in you, immune uh, response and immune cells and all that stuff, also that we take for granted all the time, that you know we have 10,000 mutational errors a day and our immune system's constantly, constantly, constantly taking care of them. You don't know if it was the fairy dust or if it was the actual like treatment, if it vanished or if it was by the fairy dust, I mean the immune system. So like there's so many, there's so many inner workings involved with what happens to that cancer uh, versus a, I guess, you know, a better study where you actually make sure that cancer existed in the mouse beforehand and then you do the therapy because now you know that it's escaped the immune system. Um, I'm sure you've seen that like on, on social media about how these studies come out and then, a lot, you know, I get a, probably 10, 12 a day mm -hmm. of like, hey, I saw this article on whatever and, and it's, it's difficult to really just explain in a short amount of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I've actually, and I'll, and I'll do this in somewhat of a biased thing is reference my own work. Uh, my thesis project, um, one of the things that was the most important to me, it was actually showing that the things I was seeing in vitro were also seen in vivo in our in a very good mouse model of a type of cancer I was studying called uh, ovarian clear cell carcinoma. Mm. Uh, now, specifically in ovarian clear cell, uh, there's these proteins that are often highly expressed and one specific protein which we studied in my lab, which is ARID1A. Um, it's frequently mutated and lost due to a frame shift mutation in ovarian clear cell, and it's an epigenetic modulator, so it regulates a lot of genes. It's, this ma it's part of this massive complex, ARID1A is part of this massive complex that regulates a lot of genes. And so in my thesis work, I discovered that it regulates uh, genes associated with the stress response that you know normal cells also use for sustaining their own health. Um, but these, we found that cancer cells utilize this stress response uh, more uh, when they lose this specific protein because it turns out this massive complex regulates those genes to suppress the, the, the stress response when cells get too stressed. So it's, it's about this um, maintenance of balance or homeostasis in, in cancer cells. Um, so they suppress this stress response that when they lose this protein, you have increased amounts of the stress response to deal with the, the particular stressor. So I found that losing this particular protein, protein increased the stress response and were able to target that with uh, small molecule drugs. I saw this in vitro. And so the first thing I thought was move this into a mouse model where we have a clinically relevant mouse model um, that very, very physiologically matches what patients exhibit uh, for OCCC in the clinic. Um, so these mice develop really large interversal tumors on the ovary, um, and they also develop very, very kind of nasty uh, ascites formation. So the, the abdomen fills with, with a lot of blood um, in the peritoneum. And so uh, we found that when we inhibit this particular stress response in our in vitro systems and our in vivo mouse models that we see a significant uh, reduction in tumor uh, growth over time. So uh, basically you're like, you're, you're suffocating the adaptiveness or basically the almost calamity that takes place in the cell to have to like quickly really adapt to the environment. You're, you're tempering that process, right? Yeah. Because, because it's already been unenveloped or, or unbridled because it doesn't have the thing that would otherwise like keep it calm. Like it I lost think. that. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it, that's one of its actual neoplastic or malignant properties that help it grow. And you say, whoa, whoa, whoa let's go ahead and put the brakes on it again mm -hmm. because our cells are polite cells. They're like, they're, they're very loyal cells. They know that if something's messed up, they like, they have a self detonate button. Like that is some of the properties of our cells to say, Hey, I know that if something looks awry, like I have at least a couple of things to say, I, I, I need to go out. I'm injured. I shouldn't be at, you know, at war, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you're basically saying this protein, that sense of something's not right or, or don't, let's not, let's not try too hard to overcome this because we may turn into cancer cells. Mm -hmm. That's gone. And then how you're re-enabling it. And that's just one example in clear cell ovarian cell, you know, yeah, ovarian cell cell. and I hope anyone listening can hear how that's why this stuff is so complicated. Yeah. I mean, our lab, um, I was in Rugang Zhang's lab at, at Wistar. He actually just uh, moved over to MD Anderson. Um, but, he, you know, I was in his lab and, and his whole lab is dedicated to basically just high grade serous ovarian cancer and just ovarian clear cell carcinoma. And, you know, he's published through his lab, countless, countless research articles upon a variety of different mechanisms. While I was there within the five years, we published work, you know, showing that you can inhibit glutamine uh, metabolism by glutaminase inhibition. There's an FDA approved drug for that. I forgot the actual name for it. It's CB839 is the, the chemical designation because, you know, MD world and PhD world are a little bit different. So, Much. Um, you know, we have different terms for things, but 
So we studied glutaminase, meta uh, met or, yeah, glutaminase metabolism associated with ovarian clear cell. In my case, we studied this thing called the ER stress response being upregulated in ovarian clear cell. In high-grade serous uh, cancers, there's a, a DNA methylase that's often overexpressed called CARM1. Uh, we found ways to inhibit that. Um, so there's a variety of different methods that often one cancer type will utilize to just you know sustain its growth. It's never just one or two things even. It's, it's usually hundreds due to um, you know cancer cells literally just doing like all your cells do, just trying to survive in a particular environment. And right, so we have to figure function. out all of these things and try and calm things down, so to speak. Yeah, and a lot of times they do a shotgun approach. Like a cancer will just, in that stress, shotgun 20, and then like you just don't know which one will hit and make it successful. So how do you account for all 20? Yeah. And of course, a lot of these tools are the same ones your regular cells has. It's interesting, I, I had a podcast with Cliff Reed, who has this company, Trevero. What he does is he recognizing, he's like, we recognize it's complicated, right? And he's like, how do we bypass that? So he basically has the thing where you take the fluid out that has a bunch of cancer cells, like say an ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. you know, the societies you mentioned. And he basically puts them in like 10, 20 different tubes and then puts a control group. And, you know, these cells stay alive for three days. So they get over there overnight. Mm -hmm. And then they all start to shrink. They all start to crenate or basically die, you know, and, and lose their mass. Mm -hmm. And he puts like the therapies in these 20 tubes that are all like FDA approved. And he cal they calculate in, into some insane precision. If there's an accelerated uh, mass change or delta, like it, it, the mass drops yeah. more than the, than the control group, yep. then there's some intracellular calamity, some efflux, or just like pumping out some stuff that says it's probably gonna be tumor. And it, like, you know, it's very early, but they're looking at like 90, 95% like, you know, consistent rates with that. And that's, that's a way to bypass I mean, of course, we need you all like to be, you know, to, to know every tool, but that's an actual evaluation for that cancer cell specifically. And whatever the case may be, you can already see the change. So those are all these are all the different ways to think about it. Yeah. And again, that's called uh, Travera. And I thought that was interesting. No, I think that's but, a phenomenal way to screen for specific drugs that are already FDA approved, because if they are FDA approved and you find that, um, you know, given the samples that you have that one drug in particular is decreasing the overall mass greater than the others compared to the control. You get it. You can begin to, to determine the overall mechanism as to why that particular cancer is growing. And you can right. fast track it into treating that, that cancer patient. I actually think that's one strategy which will make uh, cancer therapies more personalized. And I think that's super important. It is. And that's, you know, it's, it's 72 hour turnaround. So like, yeah. like at least I have an idea, like, whereas, Right now, I have to wait six to eight weeks and hope they respond. So like, it's literally like a month and a half or two months of obviously like usually cytotoxic poison-ish like, like chemo only to find out then based on restaging scans. So like it, it basically could revolutionize cancer. And, and a lot of people are looking at different kind of creative ways like that. We had another one with Laura Tower where they recreate the cancer based on that, D, that molecular footprint mm -hmm. in fruit flies. And they call them avatars and then they just expose them to all these different things and then this one takes six months and they see what kind of constellation and they even put it in the same you know mid gut and whatever it is to try to mirror it as close as possible so there's all kinds of science on it. and all and i've discovered all these people because of, of x cures x cures is a platform that i know the ceo mika pretty well their whole purpose for you know for for free is accessibility it's like what you're doing, what you're doing with this company you signed, these antibodies, the only way we know, you said in vitro, which means on a dish, you say in vivo, which means, okay, in something that's like a human body-ish, it's a mouse, but at least it has other circumstances. When those things are checkmark, 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 then a patient get, then you try it on a patient because you know that like, okay, it's shown evidence, it makes sense, uh, whether it's new, whether you're using it in, in other tumor types already in humans, that is a trial. And the only way to be able to know that this stuff works is to find trials. And yeah. so um, it's, it's, that's one thing I always tell people. My trials are different now significantly than they were 25 years ago when we literally gave enough poison to see in a phase one, does a human die or not? And then it's like, okay, they don't die. Let's see if it works in a phase two. Now it's, you know, it's just so much more specific right. and, uh, and something that's, you know, very important to talk about. Medicine has advanced amazingly. So I have a good friend too that, um, that just got diagnosed with Lynch syndrome and I've heard, and I don't know if you're familiar with this technology, but that they're even looking at ways to encode or recode the portion in your own body with, yes, mRNA vaccine stuff 
to be able to like CRISPR and all that technology to be able to almost undo some of these like predispositions you have genetically. So these mutations in Lynch syndrome, like the, I think it's MSH1 and 6 and all that stuff. What, what's happening? Why do you have an increased chance of cancer when these things are erroneous? So a lot of those particular um, proteins, they're, they're, I think they're even enzymes that are associated with DNA repair mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and so when you mutate these enzymes, which is commonly seen as a, as a hereditary condition with these, with these people, they, you know, it's, it's a somewhat rare disease um, that they have an increased likelihood for developing things like colorectal cancer. I actually have a friend with HNPCC. And so one of the key characteristics of this is, is um, they'll develop polyps associated with uh, their disease in the colon very, very rapidly over time. So pretty much anyone who has this disease will will develop polyps over time. They have a really, really high likelihood to re for developing colon cancer. Um, and the characteristics of developing those polyps are kind of sustained inflammation within the intestine. That's a very, very simple way to put it, intestines in the colon. Sustained inflammation, which as you and I know, is inflammation is, is both very, very complicated, but it's sustained, meaning that it's chronic inflammation unresolved. And so one of the ways that a lot of people are trying to treat conditions like HNPCC as a component of these mutations or these aberrations and fixing uh, these DNA repair mechanisms and, and causing inflammation within the gut um, is by very, very carefully regulating their diet or increasing the overall amount of fiber that these people consume. So as an example, my friend um, consumes Metamucil religiously, which is psyllium, fus uh, psyllium husk uh, fiber source, a non-fermentable fiber, specifically non-fermentable um, because that can induce inflammation within the gut. People who have irritable bowel disease also know this all too well. Increasing the amount of fiber you have can reduce the overall amount of inflammation somebody with HNPCC uh, might have within the gut or Lynch syndrome. Yeah, and so with Lynch syndrome, like you said, those mismatch repair proteins, they aren't able to, like, they're deficient. So, like, you can't have, like, that 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 repair for the mismatches. And you might say, well, wouldn't that make it and it does. That's why you end up having these kind of polyps or these things that are just unregulated. Mm -hmm. But one huge silver bullet we have now for at least microsatellite instability, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a similar thing, is immune therapy. And there was that big study that came out, you know, about, I would say, six, eight months ago now where everyone's like, it's a miracle that rectal cancer all like vanished, right? Yeah. And that's amazing. It was, I mean, it, it, it's, it's great science. What's that? The New England Journal of Medicine study? Yes. Was it yes. like 12 well, patients or something like that? It was 12 patients. But the key factor was that they were, they had that problem with their mismatch repair proteins. They were all MSI high. Right. And you may say, well, that doesn't that make them uglier and the, the fact that they can't mismatch and repair and therefore they're gonna be really ugly, aggressive tumors? Yes, perhaps, but the thing is, that's what your immune system recognizes. So that's why immunotherapy, specifically PD-1, PD-L1, the one we talked about earlier, can have very brisk responses. Yeah. The way yeah. I say it is like, if you're walking past you know, if you're throwing a party and you and you always clean the house and you make sure everything's dusted, 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 and then somebody walks by a couch briskly and that air makes a big dust ball come out, all of a sudden, like you're mortified. You're like, oh my gosh, like I, I promise I dust my house or whatever. And but it looks, it, it's basically something is envisioned that wasn't. So even though everything was clear, mm -hmm. the same way where immune therapy sometimes gets to see something like melanoma, it's very effective in. It's like all of a sudden, just like, oh my goodness, I'm mortified, I didn't see it. And then it goes and actually does a very good job of taking care of it. The problem was it was disguised, it was under a couch. And so that's where, that's the exciting part of where things are headed is like, it's conceivably, conceivably, exposing something like that may take care of every last cell. Yes, like they always say, well, is it cure, is it not, is it cure, is it not? Obviously, there's a lot of sensitivity using that term with a lot of things. But what we can say is there are things happening where we are six, seven years out and we're still giving it and we're just like, can we now please talk about the C word? In this case, the good one, the cure word, and should we stop therapy? And, you know, it's happened with CLL. That's totally changed after we were able to highlight what we can attack and yeah. things like that. So it's just, it's basically, I think what we're saying is cancer is complicated. Yeah. I mean, I studied CLL for a long time too. That's actually how I got into cancer research. Uh -oh. um, first lab that I, uh, that I got into, we studied um, from, mostly like from a biochemical perspective. So I'm kind of immunology trained, but we, it was kind of as an excuse to be a biochemist. Uh, we studied all the signaling events that happen in CLL. And this is actually how I got into the endoplasmic reticulum stress response or the ER uh -huh. stress response. Because as B cells differentiate from naive B cells into plasma B cells, they 
they very dramatically uh, increase the surface area of the endoplasmic reticulum to increase the overall production of antibodies that they can make. And so one characteristic of CLL is, uh, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is that these patients will often develop kind of defective B cells, and they'll only produce one type of antibody. And this is called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS. Yes. You might have even heard that too, and it always, it always rattles my brain. But um, basically, they need to utilize the ER stress response to upregulate specific enzymes to increase the surface area enzymes and transcription factors to increase the gene signature of the surf to increase the surface area of the ER to um, uh, account for that increased immunoglobulin load or, or antibody load. And so we, when we target the ER stress response in these leukemia patients, uh, you're essentially affecting the ability of how those, those CLL cells differentiate into plasma B cells to kind of be, you know, exert their screwed up cancery thing on the, on the body. So one characteristic of, of CLL is a very swollen spleen or splenomegaly. So the way that we assessed whether or not our therapy was working was if it reduced uh, splenic uh, burden. In actual patients, the spleen will uh, enlarge and ridiculous, um, but obviously we did this in mouse models. And, you know, you have a tiny spleen in a mouse, but it went like this. Now, if you were to scale that up to what happens in a human being, uh, it's, it's uh, insane. So that's one reason why uh, I think I went off on a tandem there, but you know, kind of extrapolate a little bit on how just diverse um, different cancers can be and, and how various cells will utilize different mechanisms, although the same, uh, between different cancers to support this particular uh, one specific phenotype which we can target in multiple contexts. No, I, I love it. And that's, you know, it brings an important point that I haven't been able to say on a podcast yet, but I tell my patients all the time. When you have monoclonal stuff, so whether it's MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, or, and a lot of people don't test for this enough, but it's called monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. Mm -hmm. So it's not CLL, but it's just you got a clone of B cells and not enough of them. Right. MGUS or that you can get in that exactly what you said, aberrant or screwed up B-cell, like, oh, you have different kind of antibody. You can get things that are antibody mediated, like inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, ITP, vitiligo, anything that you would see a rheumatologist for, um, or autoimmune disease, can actually be basically a spinoff or secondary to having a clonal process, which is why I keep teaching it in all my lectures of residence and all fellows. Still haven't seen one in practice myself. I got, you know, excited about a vitiligo with CLL. I'm like, maybe it'll get better. And she's like, no, I had it since I was nine. And obviously she probably didn't have CLL because uh, I was diagnosed at you know, 45. Mm -hmm. But there's something to be said about people that usually have this MGUS or CLL and have some other kind of, again, lupus, autoimmune stuff. And when you can just attack those B cells, like like hard, like with the high dose steroids, pulse it or do it weekly, and then you give them something like you know rituximab. That that's why we use rituximab in, in rheumatology as well as oncology as well as hematology with ITP and stuff. What you're doing is bringing down these kind of things that are just like turning on, turning you know having a function, but but not playing nice. They're the kid at the park that's just like pushing them all down because he's like three years older and you're just like, bro, chill. You like, have fantastic what... analogies for things. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I just, it's because I just like a group of, this, you know, no, it's a I always say like I'm a blue collar guy. People. What's that? I think it's a great way to learn. It's good for people. I always use analogies when I teach people too. Yeah. Um, it just helps because they'll remember the analogy. It's often really, really hard to remember the jargony me uh, mechanistic details associated with the process. But if you apply it to something that people are more likely to know. They'll be like, oh, I remember when I, you know, my professor, uh, Dr. Junija told me the, uh, you know, whatever analogy you use for anything. The bully, yeah, they'll they'll just remember it and relate it to the exact mechanism, so. Yeah, and patients especially, like they get more comfortable. It's like, it's like, it's scary to get, hey, this is the five page list of all the things that can go really bad, including death and type one diabetes. Yeah. But then you're like, then you're like, but this is what's going on with your cancer and this is why we're doing it. Yeah. And all of a sudden with those metaphors and analogies, you're like, I get it. I, get, I see why it's like, it's not just a, you know, you know, feel out for the weather, but it's actually like makes sense and, and sensible. So, yeah. Well, it has been awesome having you do you, like, do you like to go by Dr. Joe, Dr. Like, what is your, do you have I like a just have people call me Joe, uh, just to keep yeah. it kind of personal. Um, just because like, I like to kind of reduce the, the whole, I want people to follow me for the information that I put out and not necessarily my title. So right. I usually just have them call me Joe. Obviously I have a handle on Instagram. It's, you know, Dr. Uh, dot Joe Zondel, but um, I, I tell people not to call me doctor all the time, so just Joe. The real question is, do you drink Joe? Do I drink Joe? Coffee? Like a cup of Joe, yeah. Every damn day, are you kidding? Oh, good, that's what I like to hear. Dude, I love coffee. 
Yeah, there was a big study that that kind of placated a lot of concerns about like, oh, it's bad for your, you know, da 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 da. Basically, the phytogens or whatever those things that are on coffee beans, decaf or caffeinated, doesn't like matter actually. They are so protective for the heart, and and there was a 25% less incidence of all things. This is on 30,000 people seen forward, three to five cups a day versus people that drink nothing. Interesting. One out of five, yeah, 20% increased survival in those that drink three to five a day, but 25% less uh, anything cardiac related, less deaths from arrhythmia, less like uh, uh, CAD everything because of what they say is the, I don't know if it's phytogens or I forget what the term is. is it like that, was a, that was a big one, that's an exciting one. What's that? Is it adaptogens or, it could be phytochemicals. Yeah. That's what, what was the last one? Phytochemicals. Yeah, there were phytochemicals that are on the surface that apparently are very productive. Now remember, it's not with the sugars and the and the and all that stuff that comes with like they're like, oh really? But I, th- I hear it's high in fat. I'm like, that's not the coffee that I'm talking about. I'm talking about coffee, coffee. Yeah, it's it's hard to weed out the specific characteristics of um, you know specific things that uh, the thing that's doing the the best output for preventing cancer. Um, another thing that that might even be related to this that I recently read. Um, you know, I'm on the NCI website somewhat often, but they. A recent published uh, study showed that people who had drank a lot of black tea also had reduced risks, not not only for cancer, but pretty much all diseases. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, they, they very explicitly stated they don't know the direct contributors, but I, th- I imagine that this is a lot like the coffee thing, where people who tend to drink more coffee or tend to drink more black tea, they have a reduced uh, risks for a variety of diseases and, and decreased true. mortality. Or decreased yeah, which mortality. is different than caffeine. That's the key that I was yeah. trying to make people understand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Joe, we enjoyed it. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? Any pearls of wisdom but, uh, relating to anything? I think I'm going to continue following you. I love yeah, the material. I mean, the only thing that I can say, especially for cancer patients, is just be very, 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 very careful uh, where you get information on um, your disease, specifically from people on social media. Because while people may be well intending for their specific uh, information that they put out, they always they, they don't always have the credentials or the ability uh, to be giving advice regarding a particular disease like cancer. Um, and just because, especially with supplements. Yeah. And just because you have a mouth doesn't mean you need to, uh, you know, say things on social media if you have an opinion. Um, yeah. so be very careful what you read on, on, on the news online, uh, even, even amongst trusted professionals like myself and Dr. Juniga here, uh, it's tough, but, uh, it is tough. Yeah. It's tough. But calling us, we, we can't try and give people tips to, uh, to be able to see through that and, and know who you can trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the more we learn in medicine, I think, or the further we get, the more we learn, like, really this hard to beat just the natural mother nature stuff. And I don't mean natural as in like, oh, go get it and eat it because it's natural. I mean, just our bodies are equipped to do a pretty darn good job with things. Yeah. Mother nature is good, does a pretty good job with things. And if we try to cantankerously, you know, change the system and throw in wrenches or take all these supplements and vitamins, again, someone may mean well. But my general metric is if someone makes you feel dumb for not doing something, that's a red flag. Absolutely. There must be something there because most experts and professionals at the, of the top tier that in some of which I've talked on this podcast, they will always be like, we just don't know. We just like it's it, because it's more caution than it is proactive because we yeah. know the problems with proactive. Yeah. And it's it's obviously it's definitely OK to not know something. I think that that's one thing that will tell you who's an expert and who is not. Those people who frequently say, I don't know. Um, they're trying to be honest with you. They're not trying to swindle you into buying some supplements. So I think that's a very, very great tip that people need to pay yeah. attention to. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joe. We appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. And it was an, it was an honor to be here.